All right, guys, I got some more Israel updates for you here. So there's a bunch of stuff to get through, but let's start with this one. So, you know, the other day there was uh, a bombing of a refugee camp where at least 68 Palestinians died. And um, Elon A. Levy, Levy, who's an Israeli government spokesperson, um, he came out and basically was like, oops, it was a mistake, our bad. And that's it. But he didn't even say that the hitting of the camp and killing 68 people was a mistake. Oh, they he used the wrong said munition. They used that's the right. Wrong munition. Yeah, that's right. So it's not even like, oh, we really, you know, we don't really want to hit a refugee camp and kill a bunch of civilians. It was like, oh, we just happen to use the wrong munition here. And if you listen to the interview too, he's so casual about it. Like, well, mistakes remain. We're trying to learn. We're doing the best we can. What are you going to do? I don't even know why they bother to, like, contest the specifics of any one atrocity. Because there's, like, multiple atrocities every single day. Yeah. You know what well, I mean? The reason they do it is because if they can, like, sort of throw sand in the eyes on one thing, then they use that to pretend like everything is different than how it's being portrayed. And it's, we're doing our best everywhere. And... You know, just like they used the whole buildup to attacking Al Shifa as a pretext for attacking every other hospital. Right. And it works because now, you know, hospitals have been attacked left and right and the media doesn't really ask any questions because they were able to present some kind of a case, which ended up, of course, falling apart, that this was like Hamas Grand Central. And then after that, it just becomes sort of commonplace and accepted that like, oh yeah, we're just going to attack hospitals now because of the case we built on this one. Yeah, that's a great point. That's totally true. I don't remember if it was Al-Shifa or Al-Ali, but yeah, they argued vociferously over the specifics of that one. And then now they've bombed over 20 hospitals and you don't hear about the other 22 hospitals they bombed. They just always bring it back to like, well, remember that one? Well, you know, we were right about that one. Right. Which isn't even accurate. But you're right. They argue over the particulars of one to muddy the waters on the rest on of them. everything. Yeah, that's a that's good point. Right. Um, so we also have this. South Africa has instituted proceedings against Israel before the International Court of Justice under the Genocide Convention. So basically they're trying to charge them with war crimes. Um, I thought that this was sort of like poetic justice that South Africa, the former apartheid state, who, you know, is, was most similar to how Israel functions now, they're the ones who are like, we're going to do this. And I've seen a lot of people saying online that, like, they have more courage than, like, all of the Arab states combined. Because a lot of the Arab states are, like, huffing and puffing and, you know, virtue signaling like they're on the side of Palestinians, but nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. Whereas South Africa is like, we're going to try to file war crimes charges. I've never seen a, a procedure like this before, so I don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> My guess is that since Israel's a top U.S. ally, they just get away with anything in the same way that we got away with the Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan and Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay. But, it, you know, it's nice to see that at least somebody is taking international law seriously. Yeah, and there was a fantastic um, clip of the uh, South African foreign minister talking about the hypocrisy of the West and the U.S. in particular between how we talk about Ukraine and yes. how we talk mm -hmm. about Russia's attacks on Ukraine versus here where none of the laws of war apply, where there's no concern whatsoever, everything's dismissed. There's a little bit of like alleged behind the scenes hand wringing, but that's it. And she said basically like, you know, you have to apply this consistently or else we're not living in a post 1948 world. Right. Meaning all of these things that we put in place, Geneva conventions, et cetera, et cetera, to say we never want to see these type of atrocities again. It's over, it's gone. I read through some of the um, report that they filed along with initiating these proceedings, laying out their case. And one part in particular was really important, which is, you know, typically in establishing the crime of genocide, the most difficult part is um, proving intent, right? Because how do you, most countries and people don't go around like, hey guys, we're doing a genocide, take a look. But in this instance, they're doing it. They kind of yeah. are. And they have official after official, including Netanyahu, you know, the finance minister, just, I mean, military officials, scores of them with all of these comments about, you know, treat them like Amalek and their animals and bloodthirsty animals. And there are no innocent civilians, just one after another, after another. And it's like, if you couple together what they're doing on the ground with what they're saying about what they're doing on the ground, plus their capability clearly like, you know, just wildly outmatched in terms of Hamas versus um, the Israeli government, 
you know, it's a very clear, clear case here that this meets the textbook definition of genocide. There's never been any accountability for Israel, and that's why they feel like right now they can say these things and do these things. It's sort of like, remember that uh, case of affluenza where like there was this rich young kid who was spoiled his whole life and he committed some crime and his defense attorney literally used the argument of like he has affluenza. Like he doesn't understand the consequences of his actions or accountability because his dad is rich and he's been shielded his entire life. It's sort of like that, right? Like, like Israel is like, it, the US is like the rich dad and Israel is like our obnoxious, rambunctious criminal son. And like, we just let them get away with anything and we've shielded them from any consequences at all. So now that's why they're boasting. That's why they say these things. That's why they act like they're not doing anything wrong, even though the rest of the world can clearly see that what they're doing is war crime on top of war crime within war crime. At this point, I'm not even sure which direction the like parent-child relationship yeah, runs. that's true. Because yeah. it seems like they have so much control over our politicians, our politics, our, you know, just just the, I don't know if you have this listed to cover, you probably do, or just like bypassing Congress to sell them whatever weapons they want. I do. We'll bring that want. up. Yeah, we'll bring but, that up. Um, so, I mean, it seems like, and all of this is against our like foreign policy interests, our service members who are in the region, which, you know, why are they still in the region? But that's another story. Their targets, they're in danger. We've had to pull together this yeah, coalition I got, to protect I got on that too, the Red stuff Sea. On that. Yeah. You know, which is a humiliation because most of the countries were like, we don't want anything to do with. So this is with this, um, there's, you know, potential war with Iran. So this is a disaster for U.S. interests. And yet we're getting like pulled around and led around by the nose and whatever they want to do. Yeah. So this is really something to Naftali Bennett. He tweeted the following. Iran is a terror octopus. More on that in a minute, because that phrasing terror octopus, yeah. it, it has... Uh, shades of something similar that's been used in the past. Oh, interesting. It's arms, Hamas, it arms Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, and they're sowing chaos and terror across the world. It's time for the U.S. and its allies to target its head, Tehran, and bring down its regime. And so he wrote an article, I believe this is in the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. and Israel need to take on Iran directly, make the Ayatollahs pay for sowing chaos through their Hamas, Hezbollah, and Houthi proxies. So this is a guy who's saying, the U.S. needs to fight our wars for us. He's coming out and saying it. It's time for the U.S. and its allies to target Iran. Yeah. It, and, it's astonishing. Like, you're you're literally just dragging the U.S. in and saying, you do our dirty work for us. Now, I mentioned the octopus thing and why that's interesting. Yeah. It's a very famous old anti-Semitic trope of, like, uh, you know, Jews being the octopus and their tentacles are, like, oh, in everything. You never heard that one before? No, I don't know. Yeah, so now he's flipping that on Iranians and Iran. Like, oh, Iran, you know, they have their uh, slimy tentacles all over the world and all these terror groups, and that's why hmm. the U.S. needs to bomb them. Wow, I didn't know that history. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it also is astonishing. So this guy was very recently the prime minister of Israel, yes. right? So mm -hmm. he's this foreign politician brazenly taken to the pages of one of the top U.S. news media outlets to say we should be risking our sons and daughters in their war. And listen, to be clear in the op-ed, he says, oh, well, we could, you know, it doesn't have to be a direct war. Here's all these other things you could do to help foment regime change. As if there's no risk associated with that, as if that doesn't lead to inevitable escalation if you're directly, aggr directly aggressively trying to take out the current Iranian government. So I think if it was any other country in the world, literally, where you have a, a politician writing in our pages like, hey, what, how about you guys come and fight our wars for us? Imagine Australia telling us to like Trying start to war with another country for right, them. We like, were, we'd be like, fuck you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Even Zelensky. Yeah, you know, that's right. If mm -hmm. he came in the pages of the Wall Street Journal and was like, hey, I think y'all got to like regime change Russia. What about it? Come on. It's time you take this on directly. People would rightly be very irritated and outraged by that. But when it's Israel, we're just like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. he's right. Maybe we should get into a war. So this is really interesting. Israel Today reported this, that I, I'm not sure I believe it, but okay. Biden apparently yeah. hung up on Benjamin Netanyahu, quote, this conversation is over. Biden and Netanyahu reportedly engaged in a heated phone call where Biden demanded the release of tax revenues for Palestinians. Israel halted sending the tax money after October 7th, claiming the funds would go straight to Hamas. So the reason why I'm not sure I believe this is because every single day you have like hundreds of Palestinian civilians being massacred and we have video of it. We have pictures. 
there's no more plausible deniability in any way, shape, or form. And if Biden was ever going to take a stand, I would think, first and foremost, it would be like, hey, you're bombing babies and they're dying. The idea that he gets worked up over, like, tax revenue for Palestinians, that strikes me as absurd. I mean, it's not an insignificant issue in general. Because, but compared to murdering compared, babies, yeah. Correct, yes. It's only in the context of, like, these ongoing daily atrocities and war crimes that we're directly aiding, aiding and abetting that you look at this and you're like, this is the least of our worries at the time. The other thing that's insane about this, though, is, you know, we're talking about these are tax revenues to the the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank had nothing to do with October 7th, and yet they're being punished, and those revenues are being withheld. This is a particular, uh, like, you know, brainchild or whatever of uh, Bezalel Smotrich, who's the insane finance minister. He doesn't want to let them have any tax revenue. Apparently, Bibi had come up with some alternate plan where they could go through, I think it was Norway, and he had floated that, so Biden's like, how about we do that, and then he backed it out of that so that's why he was allegedly pissed off but i agree with you i'm skeptical of all of these reports of these like tough behind the scenes conversations yeah, at this point because it just seems like virtue signaling of like oh we're really we're really giving them a hard time here we're really telling them what we think you're just not seeing it publicly but behind the scenes we really are i just i don't really buy it yeah either. their real agenda and real intentions will always be proven by the policies they're pursuing by what they're actually doing and the policies they've pursued have been effectively a total green light for israel and that's why you have israeli officials saying openly on israeli tv we feel no pressure at all from the white house that's right we understand he's just virtue signaling and finger wagging because he's got to domestically try to cover his ass it's not only that it's also an attempt to buy Israel more time because it's like if we're there like oh we're, we're working with them behind the scenes etc and we told them that what they do in the south of Gaza can't be like what they did in the north of Gaza then the idea is that'll allow them to extend the military campaign and extend the length and the um you know the extent of the atrocities that they're committing so I think it's even more nefarious than them just trying to like virtue signal and cover their ass so we also have this from the Wall Street Journal uh, about how just how destroyed Gaza is. Only 30% of homes are left standing. That means 70% of them are destroyed. 65% of the schools are now gone. By the way, we've seen specific examples of like government buildings or schools being demolished after the fact. Nobody in there, they, you know, lace it up with TNT or whatever and they blow it up. So again, the idea, it just, just goes flies right in the face of the notion of a hunt for Hamas. It's like, really, what does this have to do with Hamas, right? Raising um, farmland, too. Yeah, and no, that's right. They were doing that in North Gaza. A new report analyzed thousands of satellite images of northern Gaza from before and after October 7th. Their conclusion, almost 70% of nor northern Gaza's homes and 50% of its buildings, 50% of its buildings have been damaged or destroyed by the 29,000-plus Israeli bombs and munitions. Nearly all of Gaza's 36 hospitals are closed. Only eight can take patients, and over 65% of its schools are damaged. So that just gives you, um, you know, a little bit of a sense of how bad it is. I, we also have new numbers that just came out from the human rights group Euromed Monitor. Now, for the first time, we've crossed the 30,000 dead Palestinians mark. Uh, of the 30,000 that are dead, 27,681 are civilians. We're now at 11,833 children. We're almost at the 12,000 mark for children. We're at now over 6,000 women. It's 6,009 women. When you look at injuries, it's over 58,000. Uh, murder journalists, more on that a little bit. There's 104 journalists who have been killed. This is the deadliest conflict for journalists ever in recorded history. Wow. Uh, it was 1.9 million of the 2.3 million Gazans that were displaced. Now it's 1.92 million. Um, and then I can give you uh, just, just a couple more here. We have uh, 191 mosques have been damaged, three churches uh, have been damaged. You have 236 healthcare professionals who were killed. Um, and then we mentioned hospitals before. 23 hospitals have been bombed, 57 clinics, 84 ambulances. Yes. Um, I mean, what is there to say, right? It, it, it just every time these numbers come out, it gets worse and worse. And <laughs> we just keep giving them weapons and, and money. And in fact, I have that for you here as well. So this is originally from the Associated Press. You mentioned it before. Um, the Biden administration bypassed Congress to give Israel more weapons. It's a $147.5 million sale. And this, the point everybody makes, which is so true, is like, you bypass Congress for something like this, but then when it comes to, you know, whatever, raising the minimum wage, things right. that like ending homelessness, whatever, fill in the blank. 
that it's like you go, oh my god, we can't do anything. Our hands are tied. Look at Joe Manchin. Look at Kirsten Cinema. Look at this. Look at that. Yeah. But when it's more when money it's more, and weapons to a, they figure it out. a country committing a genocide, it's yeah, green light. We just found a way to go around Congress. Biden himself described what Israel is doing in Gaza as indiscriminate bombing. Yeah. And indiscriminate then he bombing gives them more weapons. It's a war crime. <laughs> so you are acknowledging you know they're committing war crimes. That's your description. And yet you're bypassing Congress to help them commit more war crimes? I mean, could the link be any more direct? And you even had people like Tim Kaine who were pissed off about this, you know, very centristy Democrat who was like, there should be no sale to any country that doesn't go through Congress because then you eliminate any sort of check, any sort of transparency for the American people. And this is also part of why you know, all these conversations, oh, you know, Biden was so tough with BB, et cetera, et cetera. Bullshit. Bullshit. If you were concerned about civilians, you wouldn't be doing things like this. If you were actually thought that the bombing was indiscriminate, if you actually thought that this was o over the line and that you're concerned about what their plan is, you would not be doing, taking actions like this. Even the national security aligned Democrats, yes. like, like the CIA caucus, yeah. I call them, like right. Abigail Spanberger and some others, Let's even they, Slotkin, in, people, yeah. they've broken with Biden. They broke with Biden like a week or two ago. And they were like, we, we need a ceasefire. This has gone way out of hand. Yep, that's right. That's right. So we also have um, a U.S. base was attacked in Syria. Official Iraqi sources report uh, an attack on the American Algier base in Syria. And then right after that, we get this. Um, Syrian media says that the U.S. hit nine Iranian targets in Syria. It includes the headquarters and arms depot and convoy crossing the Iraqi border into Syria. They were struck and destroyed by an unknown aircraft. It is said to have resulted in at least 20 Iranian-backed fighters being killed or seriously injured. So um, this is, it, you know, we've seen bits and pieces of this. The U.S. attacking Shia militias in Iraq, in Syria, um, and it, look, it's all, it all stems from the same thing, right? It all stems from Israel's aggression, and then there are retaliatory, stri retaliatory strikes against Israel and the U.S. as a direct result of what Israel is doing. And instead of like, you know... There's the very famous story of, I think it was in Lebanon, where uh, Ronald Reagan cut and ran after the bombing of a U.S. base there. And like, that's the right thing. To, why are you in Lebanon? Right. Like, that's the right thing to do. What are you doing there? Right. You want to you want to knock an attack? Don't be there. Why would you be there? Right. Right. And we're viewed as hostile and aggressive because we're arming the nation there that is doing a genocide. So, like, of course, this is going to happen in this scenario. Why would you not just pull out? There's no reason for us to be. I mean, Trump very very famously and very candidly came out and said why we were in Syria, too. It's yeah. like, well, we're, getting, we're taking the oil. That's why we're there. That's yeah. why we're occupying part of Syria. We're taking the oil. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, so we've created a target-rich environment um, for any potential attacks. We're getting drawn more and more and more into this. You know, we're being forced to fight these various militias and take control of the Red Sea and fight against the Houthis and all of this. So you've got enough Tali Bennett like, hey, let's just do regime change in Iran. And um, the, the cause is Israel's aggression and our support of it. Our support of it. Because they're not wrong to see us as being implicated in this. Yeah. I mean, not only are we greenlighting these weapon sales and bypassing Congress, we're providing the diplomatic cover for them as well. Um, we're providing, you know, we're providing the largest support in the world for this country. So, of course... They're going to see us as linked to it because we are, because our tax paid, our tax dollars are going directly to fund what's happening there. And uh, we also provide them veto power at the UN in exactly. the Security Council, which is super important for them. Um, so I mentioned journalists before. There's a journalist, Jabber Abu Hadros, Hadros who's a correspondent of Al-Quds, and um, he was killed along with many members of his family as a result of an Israeli airstrike on wow. his home. So again... Um, this is targeted. There were stories early on about how Al Jazeera journalists were targeted, their family members were targeted. A lot of these things went really viral. There was a famous video of an Al Jazeera reporter breaking down on air because his family was just killed. Um, no, Rafat al uh he's an academic and intellectual who was targeted by Israel very specifically, very directly. It was very purposeful. Um, and so... Who's, I believe, a, what, a Reuters photojournalist actually in southern Lebanon. 
that that's right. Reuters yeah. did, and they did an investigation. They said this was the direct targeting. Yeah, they're doing it on purpose. They're doing it on purpose. Yeah. And uh, not a word from the White House. Well, actually, on the contrary, they still come out with these statements of like, oh, we honor journalists worldwide. Yeah, on like so Press Freedom Day, press they did that. It's like, how dare you, man? Exactly, exactly. You have, I mean, zero. You have negative credibility on this, and they don't say a word about any of this happening. Yeah. So this is interesting from Haaretz. There's thousands who are protesting across Israel for Netanyahu's ouster. And then Gantz the, and Defense Minister Gallant rejected Netanyahu's invitation for a joint press conference. Hmm. And so, but, you know, look, do I want to see Netanyahu go? Of course. But am I under any illusions that anybody else would not be doing the exact same thing or potentially even worse? Right. No. I mean, Yair, Yair Lapid, who's supposed to be like the opposition party guy, I watched the full thing he released on Twitter, like three weeks into into their slaughter of Gaza, and it sounded just like Netanyahu. It sounded just as bad as Netanyahu. It's well, all wah wah. We're the victims in every situation ever. We're oppressed, so we get to be the oppressor now. Wah wah. Like well, you they see have where it coming. Israeli public is right. You know, you yeah. see where they mm -hmm. are, and they're famously a democracy, right? So, um, what was it? Eighty three percent who were like ethnic cleansing. That's yeah. what we're mm -hmm. for. And then 68% extremely for ethnic cleansing. Right. And then what was, what were the numbers? Only 1.8% said the IDF yeah. had gone too far in their bombing campaign. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is where the Israeli public is. This is where the politicians are. Yeah. There's almost in terms of the actual prosecution of the war, the biggest divides are around, you know, the security military failures, the judicial overhaul stuff right. that was mm -hmm. predates uh, yeah. October 7th. And um, there are some there are some disagreements over whether or not to pursue another hostage deal and a temporary pause in order to secure a hostage deal. Well, I know what the hostage families want. They want. I know all, what they want. All the hostages released of course. in exchange for however many Palestinian also release all the Palestinian prisoners. political prisoners. Yeah, yeah they're being absolutely. held illegally. Absolutely. Um, so I did just see that there were some uh, renewed talks. Uh, in Qatar or with Qatar to try to move pr potentially towards another hostage release deal. But anyway, it's not like the the opposition is saying, let's have peace and a two-state solution. Far so um, I don't know how familiar you are with IDF TikTok, mm, but too, man, it is, oh it. my God. So anyway, I watched one earlier where Israeli soldiers are mocking and destroying a mosque. And they like mock the, you know, like the, the Muslim religious like chants. Mm. They like mock and that throughout it. And they show them blowing like up the mosque. And they're having, again, very uh, hunt for Hamas -y we got going on here, right? They're very really just going after Hamas. Yeah. Most moral army in the world yeah. right there. Uh, then we have uh, Al Quds Hospital sheltered 14,000 refugees. Israel burned much of it and crushed, burned, and bombed its entire fleet of ambulances to render it completely out of service. Mm -hmm. And we have new footage. That, again, this is from the chief communications uh, director of Euromed Monitor, the human rights group. So, this, again, very targeted, very specific. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. It's not like they're bumbling and incompetent. No, this is all purposeful. Yeah. This is all purposeful. Biden gave them such an assist on their right to attack hospitals, which is almost always in all instances a war crime, when he claimed that not only was he relying on Israeli intelligence with regard to uh, Al Shifa Hospital, that this, this Hamas command and control, etc., but that he had, we had intelligence suggesting that as well. Now there's multiple reports, including the Washington Post, comprehensive um, analysis that this was all total and complete and utter bullshit. But once this was established and once the U.S. president said it, then it was total green light to hit whatever hospital they wanted to Yeah, hit. money the waters, move on. Do business as usual. Yeah. And then three weeks later, maybe, or a, a month and a half later, something comes out. Yeah, this wasn't exactly right. You know, yeah. when not as many people when are following already, that. Yeah, exactly. When premature babies have already been cut off of their oxygen supply. And, and are decomposing in a bed. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is from Tria Parsi here. I found this really interesting. So uh, we were talking about U.S. credibility before on the global stage. Mm. And because of Israel, now there's a, a reduction in global support for Ukraine. Hmm. Quote, diplomats from the Global South who previously backed Ukraine in the General Assembly have indicated that they will not do so in the future out of frustration over the West's lack of solidarity with the Palestinians. Hmm. So in other words, it's like, yeah, every argument that you guys made, rightly, by the way, in defense of Ukraine against Russian aggression, agree, in principle, you're correct. All those arguments apply when it comes to Palestinians. Every single one of those arguments applies when it comes to Palestinians. But you don't care. You don't back Palestinians at all. You back Israel. 
the aggressor, the aggressor. I mean, it obviously the 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 comparison here is like right what Russia is doing in Ukraine is like what Israel's doing in Gaza, except Israel's doing way more and way worse yeah. in a much shorter time frame. Yeah. Right? So they're like, we're sick of your hypocrisy. Yeah. I mean, the the action in and of itself, like, it doesn't, it's not really fair to punish Ukraine for U.S. hypocrisy on no, Gaza. No, on the merits, it's actually like, don't do that. But I understand with I the under, logic. I do too. Yeah. And um, I, the Global South has always looked at the Russia-Ukraine war through a different lens because they always kind of felt like, they always felt like all for oh this is some fight for democracy bullshit like this is that is not your goal that's not what you're in this for there may be a, a genuine noble principle there there really is but this is not the reason why you actually care about this country yeah, it's about western capital and, and bringing ukraine into the western sphere of influence that's yeah about. and um i mean you've been talking about this kyle like this is a new era that, you know, all of the concerns, supposed concern about human rights and against war crimes and against genocide, like this was always, there was always a level of hypocrisy. It was never perfect. It was never anywhere close to perfect. But even the notion that these rules apply at all. It's just laughable now. It's gone. It's just laughable. In it's fact, gone. You, we were talking about this earlier. Russia just launched, uh, launched an attack, multi-front attack in Ukraine, and there were reports of all this different civilian infrastructure getting hit. And what I said to you is, I wouldn't be surprised if this is directly as a result of watching Israel do all these things, yeah. get away with it, and then he goes, okay, gloves are off, game, game on. on. If, yeah. if, if that's what we're doing now, fine, then I'm gonna do that. And I blame the US directly for that, because you could have drawn a line in the sand. Look, I actually, maybe I'm old school, but I actually want international law to be a real thing. I, I want human rights to exist. Yeah. I want it to be objectively enforced. And we're just so far away from that. And then, by the way, also in retaliation, Ukraine just launched an attack against a Russian city that's 25 miles over their, uh, into their border. And they also were attacking civilian infrastructure. So is this the world we want to live in? Do we want to pretend like the Nuremberg Tribunal didn't happen? Is that what we want to do? We want to pretend like the Geneva Conventions aren't a thing? Yeah. We want to pretend like, you know, hey, we're right back in the medieval times and like we've been talking about. What did Israel do in Gaza? A medieval style siege. Yeah, no food, right. no fu fuel, no water, no electricity, all that stuff. I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in that world. The minute that they did that and the U.S. said nothing, nothing. They actively come out and say, we are going to starve the entire civilian population. Then they knew they could get away with anything. Anything. They knew anything. there were no limits because that is just... Holy, uh, there is no circumstance where that is justifiable. I know. Where that is legitimate. Imagine it's your family. Imagine, imagine it's our family. Imagine it's you watching this. Imagine it's your family. They can't get food, fuel, they water, can't. electricity because some faction that you're not affiliated with at all did something wrong somewhat in your name. Like, really? That's what we're talking about here? You could just starve civilian populations? I can't imagine having one day where... I couldn't find food for the children. Like, oh I, my God, I can't, forget it. I can't, I can't imagine it. Like it's, and now you have people who are starving to death. You have a worse famine in Gaza than even the horrors of Yemen, which we were also implicated in, oh. by the way. I mean, that's the level that we're at and there's no end in sight, no end in sight. So uh, this is one tiny speck of what I think is good news. Okay. There's this new billboard, billboard truck that's driving around hospitals in Michigan, and it says this, quote, can't afford healthcare? Sorry, you gotta give Israel billions to bomb children. Good for them. Uh, I wanna see as many of these things as humanly possible. Get out there, man. These billboard trucks that say stuff like this, super based, just peace. wake people up, man. Oh yeah, taxpayersforpeace.org did this. Yeah, because I- Wake people up, man, shake them out of their complacency, because this is exactly true, this is true. That's absolutely true. And it's such a, um, like, normie, nonpartisan, uh, message of too, course yeah of like hey there's a lot of shit we need to do here in the u.s and in the, we are always here oh we can't afford that we can't do that it's too hard etc but you're they are happy to take your tax dollars and ship them to bomb babies in gaza That's congratulations right. so this is also in Haaretz, uh and we talked about this the last time too that there was a uh, high school principal who had shared something on facebook that was basically criticizing the lack of israeli media coverage of the crisis in gaza like basically criticizing that it's very biased, you're not seeing the devastation toward Palestinians, and this person doesn't like that. So they right. shared something about that on Facebook. 
They were surrounded by like a mob that was like really hostile towards them. Well, now the Tel Aviv Yafo Yafo municipality summoned that high school principal to a hearing before suspension after she posted that article. It was a Haaretz article. This is not some like radical right. left-wing communist no. rag. This is like but the like, New York Times of Israel. This is Red Scare level now, right? Like you literally can't say anything in defense of Palestinians, even, again, we talked about this before, but even, like, a tactical or strategic, like, I think this will make us less safe because you're tripling the size of Hamas. Right. You're not allowed to say that. Right. It's unbelievable, man. No dissent. In the Middle East. I know. They, they love saying Look that. Look at those democratic freedoms. They love saying that. Only only ethnostate theocracy democracy in the Middle East. <laughs> that's, that's what we'll call it. All right. So then I also want to show you this uh, difference between framing in the New York Times when talking about Russia versus Israel. Mm. So here's a headline on, on Russia. Russia pounds Ukrainian cities in one of the largest air attacks of the war. Mm. The missile and drone attacks killed at least 30 people and damaged blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so that's when it's Russia. Okay. When it's Israel, explosion, Gazan, Gazans say was airstrike, leaves many casualties in dense neighborhood. So passive voice versus very active, right. very direct, intentional. I mean, that's so awkward, too. I know. Explosion, Gaza, But that's New York Times, right? Airstrike. This is New York Times. They're, they're just dripping with smugness and smarminess while also, like, being totally biased and totally unaware of their own fucking bias. Yeah. Right? And it's all an effort, too, to, like, dehumanize Palestinians also. And you can't trust them. Well, they say it was... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Say, yeah. Really. Mm-hmm. All right, and we'll end with this one here. Um, Muslim leaders announced plans to actively campaign against Biden in all 50 states. So I had talked about this maybe a month ago or so when there were like the rumblings of this and you had um, some uh, Muslim leaders were starting to lead the charge and holding rallies about it or whatever. Apparently they're trying to broaden out to all 50 states where Muslims are going to stand on. We're never voting for Biden. Wow. Now, again, by the way, it's like, he's pissed off every demographic that is his demographic, right. right? You've totally, totally abandoned young people. You're totally out of lockstep with young people. Muslim Americans and Arab Americans, which make up a key crucial voting block in many of the important swing states, now you've pissed them off to the high heavens. It's like, what is, like what's your end game here, right? Your end game is just humiliation on the world stage. It's just so sick, too, because, all right, who are the top three presidential contenders? Biden, Trump, RFK Jr. And they're basically, they're identical on this issue. That's right. They all, That's I right. mean, yeah. rhetorically, it might be a little bit different. You know? I don't even Trump, know about that. Trump wouldn't do the any little bit of hand-wringing we've gotten from the Biden administration. Yeah, I guess um, that's true, yeah. And RFK Jr. probably wouldn't either because he seems to be, if anything, the most hawkish of no. the three. That man is horny for more war. But the the policy, I think it would be exactly the same. I think it would be exactly the same. That's our choice in our grand American democracy. Three Terrible. presidential candidates who have the exact same fucking policy. All right, so was there any other? I know you did a segment on this earlier, too. Is there anything that I'm missing here? Um, trying to think. I, um, I think that was, uh, you know, I talked a lot about Iran and about the uh, South Africa. Um, yeah, the South genocide. Africa. Yeah, yeah, those were the big ones. Oh, there was a, that clip of Nikki Haley. I also played of her. Oh, where she endorses like, the ethnic cleansing of yeah, Gazans. Yeah, which is, you know, in, that's it's made their mainstreaming ethnic cleansing. That's what's yeah. happening. Um, you know, this is supposedly the moderate alternative I told you, this, to Trump. This is like the lefty position in Israel is just kick him out into the Sinai Desert. Yeah. Because the right-wing position is either nuke Gaza or openly saying, just kill them all. She did that whole, like, well, what about Egypt? Where, why aren't they? Why aren't you focused on them? It's like, well, maybe because they're not the ones dropping bombs on babies and destroying all of Gaza so it is wholly uninhabitable. Maybe that's why. Well, why won't they take them in? Oh, I don't know. Maybe they don't want to participate in an ethnic cleansing. Maybe, just maybe, that has something to do with it. Anyway, pathetic. There are your updates. I'll talk to you guys soon.